I had said last week we are beginning a new sermon series today that will run through the summer, and we will be looking at some of the greatest hymns and looking at the scriptures from which they have arisen into the minds of the authors of the lyrics of the hymns. The Battle Hymn of the Republic is today's, and it's based on a number of verses in Revelation and verses in Matthew and verses in Zephaniah and verses in Isaiah and just all over the Bible. It's just fascinating. So let's pray as we begin this, uh, our sermon this morning. Lord, as we look into your word, we pray that we will be faithful to it in our understanding that you will help us through the Holy Spirit to get the message that you'd like us to get from these words. And we pray, Lord, that all that we do will be a reflection of you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as we begin our summer series, and we look at this wonderful hymn, one that my father loved and that I love just as he loved, and many, many other people truly love this hymn, I did some research. And I was surprised. I was surprised by several things as I researched about this hymn. I was surprised that its author, Julia Ward Howe, wrote it in a burst of inspiration before rising early one morning. I was surprised that despite the hurried penning of these lyrics, that they are full of biblical references that are accurate and on point um, from throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments. And I was surprised that as I read it, as I read different blogs and essays and whatnot about what this hymn is all about, I learned that it's become controversial in recent years, that it is not a favored hymn by all Christians, that for some it's not a source of inspiration and patriotism, as it is for me, but one of disapproval and renunciation. So as we look at the song this morning, we're going to look at all three of those aspects of it, the history, the circumstances of its writing, its biblical foundation, and this controversy that surrounds it today, which to me is simply baffling. So we'll begin. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That, by the way, is a younger picture of Julia Ward Howe, and we'll learn a little bit about her as we go along. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That first line of this famous hymn takes us immediately into the Bible, right into Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, and let's look at them. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As we read that, I'm sure that you see many of the images that were in the song as we, read, as we sang it earlier. And we'll see that much of the hymn is based on this particular passage of, of Scripture, but there is much, much more 
in this hymn. The number and the diversity of scripture references combined with the sudden manner in which the lyrics came to Julia Howe, Julia Ward Howe, lead me and many others to believe that this was divinely inspired, that God had his hand in the writing of this song. So let's begin with the history of the hymn. Julia Ward Howe, she lived in Boston, was a poet and an author, and she was an activist working for the abolition of slavery and working also for women's right to vote. In November of 1861, early in the Civil War, she, her husband, and her pastor went to Washington to meet Abraham Lincoln, the president. And while they were there, they went to a, um, a fort that was nearby, and they heard the singing of John Brown's body by a regiment of soldiers on parade. Now, John Brown was written to the tune, John Brown's body was written to the tune of an old Christian camp meeting song called, O oh Brother. And it was written around a campfire one night when soldiers were out in the field at war. And they came up, this group of soldiers, with these words. John Brown was an abolitionist. And he had led a failed raid two years earlier on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, on a federal armory that was there. His plan was to arm the slaves, to steal the weapons and arm the slaves, and lead a revolution against the slave owners. Now, it's interesting. His name became a battle cry for abolition. But Julia Ward Howe already, Howe already knew about his work and his um, efforts because his, her husband, Samuel Gridley Howe, who, by the way, was a physician and was the founder of Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown, he was one of John Brown's financiers. He was providing funding for John Brown's activist work. When the house heard this song, their pastor suggested that Julia write new words to replace the rather gruesome ones, which went, John Brown's body lies a moldering in its grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in its grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in its grave. His soul goes marching on. And this had become a battle cry for the Union soldiers. And they were singing it everywhere, including at this parade, military parade, at this fort outside of Washington. So Julia Ward Howe took that suggestion from her pastor and wrote six verses of this song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. And she wrote what, how it came to her, how all these verses. She wrote, I went to bed that night as usual and slept, according to my want, quite soundly. I awoke in the gray of the morning twilight, and as I lay waiting for the dawn, the long lines of the desired poem began to twine themselves in my mind. Having thought out all the stanzas, I said to myself, I must get up and write, write these verses down, lest I fall asleep again and forget them. So with a sudden effort, I sprang out of bed and found in the dimness an old stump of a pencil, which I remembered to have used the day before. I scrawled the verses almost without looking at the paper. Now we know the complexity of the verses, the wonderful meter that it holds to, the rhymes that work so well together, and the amazing references to scripture that are over and over and over through the six verses. And how can we not think 
where it was written in this rapid manner that God didn't have a hand in it. So, let's look at the scriptural references, now we've looked at the history, and examine the meaning of this hymn, the meaning behind the meaning. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. The he in this verse is obviously Jesus, and the reference is surely to his second coming. The Bible promises in numerous places that Christ will come again, bringing an end to war and strife, oppression and hatred, bigotry and persecution, and bringing a peace that's never been before known on this earth since the time of Adam and Eve before the fall. In Matthew 24, Jesus tells his disciples what the end times will be like with wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, false messiahs spreading heresies, and true believers being persecuted, causing many of them to turn away. Then in verse, verses 29 to 31 of Matthew 24, he concludes, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. It must have seemed as our country was in battle with itself being torn apart during the Civil War, brother killing brother and friend rising up and firing against friend at the time of Jesus' second coming had to be very close at hand. It must have felt that way. And so this song was one of brutal reality when considered within the context of that time with the war going on and so many being killed and, and wounded. But it was also one of hope for a future of true peace with Jesus Christ on his throne reigning over the entire world. It was a call for people to look forward to that second coming and what it promised. The second line of the song says, he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. This is a reference to Revelation 14, starting at verse 14. It says, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. He who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia, which is 180 miles today. Gruesome. But reality, those who are saved will be harvested. Those who are not saved will be pressed in the winepress of God's wrath. The next line, he hath loosed, he hath loosed the fateful lightning <clears throat> excuse me, of his terrible swift sword, is also a reference to Revelation, as well as passages in other books of the Bible. There are several references in Revelation to lightning, thunder, hailstorms, and earthquakes, all in connection with how the earth is going to end, the earth as we know it. Then Revelation 19.15 mentions Jesus' terrible swift sword, 
Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. The second verse of the song brings the message of Jesus into the actual events of the time. It says, I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. The soldiers of both armies sitting around the watch fires at night would no doubt, no doubt, in this horrible time, have been praying to God, praying to the Savior for their safety and for victory. Probably there was no actual physical altar, though there might, they might have built one, but probably not. And their, but their prayers were a spiritual altar of worship and supplication to the God that they knew would help them. By the light of the fire, the faithful may have read sentences from the Holy Bibles that they had brought with them. Maybe their mother had tucked into their bag when they left home and they found them when they got to the battlefield. And those Sentences from the Holy Bible provided succor and strength from his word. Then the last line of this verse, his day is marching on, is again a biblical reference. Throughout the Bible, in both the Old and the New Testaments, there are references to the day of the Lord, such as this one in Isaiah 13.9. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The day of the Lord. In 2 Peter 3.10 is another. Peter writes, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So again, this reference in the hymn is to those end times, which probably at that time seemed very near. As the verses continue, there's six of them in all, although most hymnals contain only four. The biblical allusions continue. The third verse speaks about the hero born of woman, crushing the head of the serpent. An obvious reference to both Christ's birth as described in the Gospels and the Genesis story about Adam and Eve failing to comply with God's rule and falling to the temptations of the serpent. After Adam and Eve confessed their sin to God, God issued the first prophecy of the Messiah to the serpent saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The fourth verse is also based mainly on the book of Revelation. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sitting, sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Ann, can you move that forward to that? Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Oh, our God is marching on. So the trumpet has been used as a call to battle for thousands of years and was certainly used in the Civil War. But there are also a number of references in the Bible to the use of the trumpet in the end times. The prophet Zephaniah, for example, warned the Israelites that the day of the Lord will be a day of trumpet and battle cry. In Matthew 24, 30, Jesus says of the coming judgment that the Son of Man will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. But in Revelation, the trumpet theme is magnified. 
as seven angels with seven trumpets unleash terrible powers upon the earth. The first trumpet brings hail and fire mixed with blood upon the earth. The second causes a mountain ablaze with fire to fall into the sea and turn a third of the sea to blood. The third causes a star to fall upon the earth, turning a third of, the, of all the rivers, turning the waters, excuse me, of a third of the world's rivers bitter. The fourth causes a third of the sun, the moon, and the stars to go dark. The fifth opens up the abyss, releasing smoke from which locusts appear and torture all on earth who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The sixth trumpet releases four angels who kill a third of all the people on earth with plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that come out of their mouths. Revelation doesn't tell us we have an unhappy little boy back there. Revelation doesn't tell us what will come with the seventh trumpet. Only that in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 30, and 31, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So the seventh trumpet is the call for those who believe to rise into the Lord's bosom. The scripture reference in this hymn continue in the remaining verses. Jesus sitting, uh, sifting the hearts of men, sitting on his judgment seat, transfiguring believers, making them holy by his death on the cross. The final verse, which is rarely sung, probably because of its, the song's length, makes the warning plain. It says, he is coming like the glory of the morning on the wave. He is wisdom to the mighty. He is honor to the brave. So the world shall be his footstool and the soul of wrong his slave. And God is marching on. Indeed, our God is marching on. And we know, just as believers at that time knew, that the end is indeed coming. And Jesus Christ will bring judgment upon the earth. Those wise enough to recognize him and brave enough to stand with him will be saved. Those who are not will not. I mentioned earlier that there is controversy today around this hymn, which seems to arise from two concerns. One is the apparent position that Christ would approve of violence to settle any issue, even one like slavery. Some object strongly to that within the Christian church. The other is an assumption that some, in, that some see in the lyrics that God favored the Union in the Civil War and that the North was executing judgment on God's behalf. For me, neither of these is a problem. The Bible is full of images of violence and war. Indeed, as we have seen, the descriptions of the end times in Revelation and by Jesus himself in the Gospels are full of violence. They should be a warning to all of us about what is to come and how we should prepare for it. The culture we live in may wish to deny the presence or power of evil in the world and therefore deny the need for God. But if we look around us with open eyes, 
The need becomes more than obvious. It's so apparent. And sadly, where there is evil, there is sometimes a need for violence to stop it. That's why we have police who carry guns. Is it unjust or counter to God's desire to stop evil with a violent act when one is necessary? I don't believe that. As for the notion that the song implies that God approved of the war in order to eradicate slavery, my answer is the same. Slavery is evil, and it must be eradicated. Attempts were made to do so without violence, but they were not successful. The Confederacy fired first upon the Union, and the Union responded. Was it God's will? God only knows. But the Bible is full of stories of God using one group of people to overcome the evil of another group of people. The Civil War, while it caused tremendous death and destruction in this country, finally eradicated slavery from the United States after more than 200 years. And it was time. The Battle Hymn of the Republic was a powerful and important hymn in the time it was written, and it remains so today. It poignantly describes the promise of our Lord to finally rid the world of all evil and bring a time of peace and glory for all who believe in him. And it warns all of us to put our faith in the Lord of justice, who will bring true victory and eternal peace into the world. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We know that the, the end times, which have not yet come, not fully at least, we know, Lord, that they will be difficult and painful for this world and for all the people who are in it. But we know, too, that you have a plan, a master plan. And that plan is to save the world, those who believe in you, and to create a new heaven and earth where peace shall finally reign, where Jesus will be king on the throne, and where each of us will live in joy and peace among our brothers and sisters. We thank you, Lord, for that promise. We pray.